Hello everyone! 2,000 years ago, a mathematician took a bath for the first time ever, leading to a new law of physics. Today, I am not taking a bath in order to apply that law of physics to my ocean simulation. It's a Christmas miracle. Today, the math isn't too bad. Our goal is to get this 3D model I stole from the internet to float in the ocean simulation I created in a previous video. Thankfully, Archimedes already did all the work for us on the math side of things, in which he suggested that any object totally or partially immersed in a fluid or liquid is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. This is known as Archimedes' principle. Conceptually speaking, this is as simple as object goes in water Water, object is pushed up based on how much that object has moved the water. But as always, in practice, it's a bit more complicated. Despite its simplicity, buoyancy is a very turbulent phenomenon, and even slight changes in the fluid movement can have visible changes to the floating object. To get a decent buoyancy simulation, we need a lot of data, and we need that data to be accurate too. This raises a number of concerns for both the computational complexity and memory complexity of buoyancy simulations, but games have had objects floating in water for years so surely it's not too bad. You might already have several questions, such as, how do you even determine how much water has been displaced by our object? Are we going to do the physics on the GPU or the CPU? If the ocean simulation lives on the GPU, how can we get it back to the CPU? And did Archimedes ever take another bath? All these questions will be answered and more, but first, something a little different. This video has been sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data science, and computer science interactively. Brilliant offers thousands of lessons from basic to advanced, so if you're just getting started learning math or are brushing up on your linear algebra for graphics programming, Brilliant has something for you. Even if you don't know where to start, that's not a problem. Brilliant customizes its content to fit what you need. Just take a quick quiz when you sign up, and Brilliant will match you with lessons that fit your interests and level of expertise. With the arrival of the new year, Brilliant is a wonderful option for finally getting started on learning all those things you want to learn but have been procrastinating. I personally use Brilliant for a quick refresher on math concepts I haven't worked with in a long time. Be sure to try out everything Brilliant has to offer with a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual plan when you visit brilliant.org forward slash ace or click the link in the description. Thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Let's start with the question that needs to be answered to even do a buoyancy simulation in the first place. How do we determine the amount of volume that our object is displacing? An object can only displace as much volume as it occupies in space, so if we determine the volume of our object, then it can only ever displace that much volume. To make our lives easier, let's put a little box around an area of our model that will be the actual target of our buoyancy simulation. It's common practice to do physics simulations on simplified geometry like spheres, capsules, or cubes, instead of the real model. The volume of a cube is the product of its side lengths, which is much easier to compute than the volume of this much more complicated shape. With the volume of the cube and the position of the buoy, all we need is the height of the water at any given point, and we can determine how much water is being displaced by subtracting the vertical position of the buoy from the height of the water. One issue though, despite our buoy and ocean visually being close together, they are are actually in a long distance relationship. Our buoy lives on the CPU and our water lives on the GPU. Like all tragic long distance situationships, one party is going to have to relocate because otherwise it's just not going to work out. This strain will put pressure on both parties until one tells the other that they have to do what's best for themselves and that they will always care about the other until a week later when they learn that all of their mutual friends have been turned against them behind their back and that there was never any love in the first place. This means that either our water needs to come to the CPU, or the buoy needs to go to the GPU. GPU buoyancy simulations do exist, and in fact, there's actually a really cool recent paper on the topic presenting a real-time solution to the problem. But I'm stuck in a weird dilemma where I want to give you guys the best visuals possible, but I also want to teach what we're actually using in the industry. And right now, GPU buoyancy simulations aren't really being used. So I'll leave that for a future video topic. Instead, let's talk about how we can get our water data from the GPU over to the CPU. It turns out, after all this hard work to create a beautiful ocean simulation driven by the GPU, we have effectively shot ourselves in the foot. 
Before we dive into the real deal, let's look at a potential alternate path for getting info about our ocean simulation. Since our ocean data lives on the GPU, we want to avoid moving that data back to the CPU, as that would immediately disqualify our game from being 60 FPS. That means in order to get the water height, we have to do the same work we do on the GPU on the CPU. For instance, doing a complete replica of our ocean simulation on the CPU means we could then get the water height at any point. This would be the best case scenario, as we would have perfectly accurate data for our buoyancy, but obviously, doing all of this work again on the CPU would be insanely expensive and wouldn't be possible in real time. One context where you could reasonably do this though is in the previous water video in which I discussed the sum of signs fluid simulation. You could very easily calculate a simplified sum of signs to get perfectly accurate height data. In essence, by improving the fidelity of our ocean simulation, we will be reducing the fidelity of our buoyancy simulation, because our only option now is to read data back from the GPU to get our water height. <laughs> But Ace Rolla, you said we can never ever read data back from the GPU. I did say that, I'll also probably keep saying it too. The reality is that I've been lying. I could not trust you all with the true power of parallel programming, the paradigm of just doing it later. GPUs do all their fancy work in parallel, but that functionality is not exclusive to the GPU. The CPU can do parallel programming too, but it's a bit less legitimate. On the CPU, parallel programming is very useful for deferring work for when it's ready, and this can apply to reading data back from the GPU. You see, the problem isn't exactly reading back the data, it's waiting for the data. It's sort of like if you ordered an Amazon package, and after clicking the submit order button, you were frozen and could not do anything until the package arrived at your door. This would be known as a synchronous GPU readback request, in which we hold everything until the data is ready, but we can also do an asynchronous request, in which the game continues going like nothing happened. Once the data has arrived, we can do what we need with it and stand by until the next GPU data package comes around. How you do these readback requests is engine dependent. In Unity, it's as easy as converting our buoy's world space position into pixel coordinates and using this function while asking it over and over and over again if it's ready yet. With a successful GPU readback, we have our first solution to the buoyancy problem, simply setting the vertical position of the buoy to the height of the water. This clearly demonstrates the lag between readback requests. If we had perfectly accurate data, then there would be no visible lag at all, so you can see why we would prefer not to use the readback solution, if we can help it, since for many problems, this much lag would be unacceptable. Thankfully, in the context of buoyancy, the lag can almost lend itself to the perceived realism, which we will see in a little bit. Without any lag, this zero IQ solution would probably be good enough in some contexts, but with the lag, it kind of looks really terrible so we can make use of physics to smooth it out a bit. Time for a little physics review. Objects have gravity applied to them. This pushes them downwards. When an object is pushed downwards into a fluid, it experiences an opposite force equal to the weight of the fluid being displaced. If this force is greater than the downward force, then the object will float. Archimedes defined the upwards force that the object experiences as equal to the density of the fluid times the volume of displaced fluid times negative gravity. Now that we have the height of our water, reading back from the GPU every few frames, we can calculate the amount of fluid being displaced by our buoy and update our forces accordingly. For simplicity, I'll be using Unity's built-in rigid body simulations, so I won't go into how these forces are actually applied to models. I would love to have time to roll my own physics simulations though, so I can explain how it all works in the future. With our physics simulation, we see much smoother movement than the previous solution, even though the data is still just as laggy. The lag comes through in other ways though. The movement is much more turbulent than it should be because large forces are exaggerated as they stick around for up to five times as long as they should. Another big issue with our buoyancy is that it only moves up and down, but in the real world, objects can rotate and be pushed around by the current. So why aren't we seeing that with our current solution? At the moment, we are assuming our water height is at the same level for every point of contact on our buoy, which would be correct if our water was a flat plane. In that context, our buoyancy simulation would be perfectly accurate. Obviously, our water is not a flat plane. The height of the water varies quite a lot over time and space, including the space that our buoy occupies. Take this little doodle of the water height as an example. If we place our buoy on it, some parts of the object are going to be displacing more water 
than other parts, meaning that this area of the buoy is going to experience a stronger upwards force than this part of the buoy, resulting in the object tipping towards the smaller force. That's not all. If the buoy is not totally submerged, then the direction of the force is going to be changed by the normal of the water surface, slightly pushing the buoy around. Although, this aspect of buoyancy results in what I would consider to be bad game design. This is obviously contextual, but generally speaking, players probably don't want the environment to move them around. They expect to stay still if they are not making any inputs. Because of that, I will be assuming forces are only applied in the upwards direction. In order to get a better buoyancy simulation, we need to approximate the amount of displaced volume more accurately so we can capture the nuance of the different forces being applied at different points on the surface of our buoy. This means we need to read back even more data from the GPU. Instead of sampling just the one point at the origin of our buoy model, we want to sample as many points as we reasonably can. Since volume is involved, you might remember what the word for an element of a volume is from my Counter-Strike 2 smoke video. If we combine the words volume and element, then we get the word voxel. We have two options here with how we model the voxels. We could cover the surface of our ocean with them. This would maybe be ideal if we had a lot of objects that we want to float in the ocean, because the alternative is wrapping our floating objects with the voxels. If we have a lot of objects, then the voxel expense is going to add up really quickly. Hence why we could sort of invert the logic and have each object query one big voxel grid that covers the water surface. But oceans are usually quite large, so this solution isn't very valid and would be ideal for a smaller body of water instead. This means we have to go with option two, which is covering our buoy with voxels, or more simply just cutting up that cube we made earlier into smaller cubes. Each one of these cubes is going to personally query the water data and hold onto the water height at that point until it gets updated again. We then approximate the amount of volume being displaced by iterating through each voxel, determining the displaced volume at its position, and applying the corresponding force divided by the number of voxels. If you're confused about that last part, please take a moment to review integral calculus and then come back. Our new voxel buoyancy simulation is a success. We can see much more interesting movement that more closely matches the motion of the waves. Although it is still laggy in the same ways as before, it doesn't matter too much. Normally, this is where we could stop. This is pretty much the de facto method for basic buoyancy because it allows the simulation to work on all axes, it isn't too inaccurate despite the noisy water data, and if you keep the voxel count low, it's not super expensive. I think we can all appreciate a good physics simulation, but they all suffer from one major problem. It's hard to control them. You kind of just have to let the simulation take the wheel, which designers can sometimes have a hard time coping with. So let's explore a solution utilized by the developers of Atlas, and probably Sea of Thieves as well, that gives you a bit more control over how the buoyancy works. Our current setup is nice because no matter which way the buoy falls or topples, it'll always work as intended. We don't need to write a whole boatload of logic to handle edge cases or anything. It just works. This comes at the cost of having very little control over how the buoy actually moves. You are at the whims of physics. If you want to have some sort of artistic stylization applied to the buoy movement, you can't really do that without modifying the laws of your physics. If we want to have control, we'll have to achieve similar visuals with logic that can convincingly fake the physics. We can more easily do this by coming up with some assumptions or restrictions for our object to better figure out how we could fake it. Let's assume that our buoy will never topple over, meaning that it always points vaguely upwards, and also that it will never sink. One benefit of our legitimate buoyancy simulation is we could easily extend it so that objects can break and sink into the water, but if we don't need that functionality, we don't have to try faking it. With these two restrictions in mind, let's see how it simplifies our physics and decipher a potential solution from there. If the buoy is always upright and never topples, then a lot of these voxels do not need to be reading data back from the GPU. They could instead just use the water data from the lowest voxel below them for a decent approximation. But but if the buoy never sinks either and is always going to hover around equilibrium, this kind of brings us back to the first solution, which is just setting the height of the buoy to the water height. Perhaps a more sophisticated extension of that would be setting the buoy's position to the average position of the sampled water points. We can apply this logic to the orientation of the buoy as well. Is there some way to get both an average position and a normal vector we can point the buoy towards at the same time? It turns out, there is! We can make use of a plane fitting algorithm. In math, when you have a bunch of data points, the line 
line of best fit is a straight line that minimizes the distance between itself and each point. This idea extends to any amount of dimensions. In three dimensions, it becomes a plane of best fit. If we imagine the bottom row of our voxel grid to be a bunch of points in three-dimensional space, we can send those points through a plane fitting algorithm to give us an origin point and a vector orthogonal to the plane that our fake floating object should point towards. Setting our buoy's position to the origin point and rotating it towards the normal vector every frame gives us a slightly more sophisticated version of the zero IQ solution at the beginning of the video. This brings us back to the major problem of that solution, the latency of the data, which is now made even worse by having multiple asynchronous readbacks contributing to our fake simulation. At this point, the water height information is basically noise, the normal vector is all over the place, and so is the origin. It's at this point that our problem space moves from physics to signal processing, as all things do. This is now a denoising issue. We have to decipher a trend from the ramblings of a madman. I unfortunately didn't have much time to explore solutions to this problem, but it would be a wonderful context to look at multiple denoising solutions to see what looks best. The developers of Atlas made use of spring physics to denoise their data, which I tried to replicate myself by assuming our buoy is anchored at height zero, and as it moves farther away, the displacement becomes less and less impactful, resulting in a smoother motion with inertia, just like real buoyancy as demonstrated here. But when I tried to extend this logic to the rotation, it didn't quite look very good. Perhaps I just did it wrong, but I think the data is too noisy, and the differences in the normal vectors aren't great enough to get any meaningful movement other than slight wobbling around the vertical normal vector. It ends up looking quite lame compared to the legitimate buoyancy. I left this segment in as a proof of concept and to demonstrate that this is where the artistic touch comes in to really sell your floating objects. In this context, we can do whatever we want with the noisy data instead of just shoving it into a physics simulation. Another benefit is that this solution is far cheaper than the voxel-based approach. We could have hundreds of buoys using this logic at interactive rates, whereas the voxel buoyancy will get very expensive very fast. In the end, buoyancy is a pretty simple concept with a deceptively vast amount of potential approaches and solutions. Each one presented in this video is perfectly valid with their own benefits and drawbacks, and there's surely many other approaches that are valid too, depending on the context. By the way, if you didn't know, you can vote for what I do next over on my Patreon and get access to some builds of my projects if you don't feel like compiling the code yourself like this one that shows each buoyancy solution next to each other. How neat. As usual, a huge thank you to all of my existing patrons. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to listen to Pokimane's new podcast while practicing piano at 4 a.m. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.